Just so you know, uh, we are having some technical difficulties. Uh, one of our cameras is not working. I'm not sure if we're live streaming. I hope we're live streaming. Also having trouble with the PowerPoints. So if you guys could, as we pray, just kind of commit this whole situation to prayer so we can get things uh, working as we want. But for now, uh, let's stand and let's commit this time to prayer. Avinu Mokenu, our Father, our King, we just thank you so much for your Torah, for your Shabbat, where we can just rest in you and learn of you. And Father, we just commit this time to you. We commit all the technical difficulties to you. And we just ask right now that your Ruach HaKodesh, your Holy Spirit, would just come and dwell amongst us now as we lift up our voices in praise. And we just thank you for your Shabbat in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. And right now we have over 15 countries and over 130 cities online watching this morning service. So we just really appreciate those from all 15 countries and the cities around the world uh, that are watching us. Uh, and we just hope that this really becomes a blessing to you as well. And at this time, we would like to introduce Pastor Art, who's going to teach us the Torah portion. Okay. All right. Well, let's, okay. All right. This works. That's very good. And it looks like PowerPoint works as well. Is that right? Okay. Well, very good. I didn't need the PowerPoint anyway. Oh, yeah, right. Yeshua didn't, Jesus didn't have any PowerPoints, although he had a wonderful backdrop to teach from. Does that make sense? Um, you know, it was, uh, Pastor Mark mentioned the conference last week, and of course, uh, not only all of you folks that were here, but people that were from around uh, uh, neighboring states, from those that are in, were in California, San Francisco and L.A., for uh, Ray and Austin that came up and uh, several people flew in. Uh, we're so glad that you were here, and uh, we were blessed to have you as a part. And so you were watching us live streaming. We're blessed to have you a part of that as well. And uh, I hope you had as many kids as we had here this morning. Where did all these kids come from? Came from someplace. They get born into this place. So... Okay, well, if this is true and the PowerPoint works, let's bring up that first slide. Uh, it's, no, it's no mystery uh, that uh, the world today is becoming a, is a chessboard uh, with the different countries moving about, different pieces. Uh, you don't know what the next move is going to be. And that's why I said it's one big chessboard because as the pieces move about, the United States and their involvement with Israel as being allies and all other countries that are allies and those that are allies on the other side uh, all like to get together and shake hands in a different way. But the important thing is, is that we all need to keep our eyes on what's going on in Israel because it has a lot to do with the future redemption and our redemption. And this uh, Torah portion, uh, which is Shalach, uh, which uh, is, is going to be very, very interesting for a lot of you. I know Pastor Mark has taught this uh, so wonderfully many times. Take a little bit a different look at it. Uh, but uh, if you notice that the way that this can be read is send for yourself. And, of course, it's about the, uh, the spies or the, the, the surveyors that went into the land before they were supposed to enter the land. Now, in the news as well, Jerusalem Post uh, one of the leaders there, Bennett, said every time we give up land, talking about Israel, people are killed. And uh, he called for the government uh, to, uh, to declare that this is our land and it's not for sale. He is the trade minister for Israel. And then also uh, Landau, which is a tourism uh, minister, he said uh, relative to some of the suggestions as to the borders of Israel that to go back to 1967 lines are like Auschwitz borders. Why? Uh, this was Perez, President Perez of Israel, which the president in Israel is kind of like a figurehead, really doesn't make, isn't to make decisions relative uh, to this type of foreign policy. Uh, but all of a sudden he became the spokesman in uh, declarations on a two-state solution. Uh, and what this tourism minister said, he said, what country starts talks that aim to break down its ability to defend itself? It's pretty amazing, and things have not changed in 3,000 years in many ways. 
And of course, John Kerry, who's our new Secretary of State and has been now for a number of months, he visited the region and he called for a treaty based on 67 lines. On your notes, notice I start in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And you may be wondering why, and I'm going to tell you why. The Apostle Paul, or Rabbi Shaul, had a number of itineraries that he went on uh, when he was in Asia Minor. You know, after Jesus was raised from the dead, after the ascension, after he was called to go to take the word to the Gentile regions. And as he was on his second itinerary, it says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12, and he not only spoke and, conf and, and uh, proclaimed that Yeshua was the Messiah to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. And he says in verse 12, now when I went to Troas to proclaim the good news of the Messiah, Yeshua, since a door had been opened for me by the Lord, I could not rest because I failed to find my brother Titus. So I left people there and I went on to Macedonia. He always, most of the time, traveled with a, uh, an entourage that he had, you know, fellow ministers of the word. And Titus, who was a very important individual, was supposed to meet him and he didn't show up. So Paul didn't have any rest in his spirit. But then he said this, as he continued on to Macedonia, where if you remember, there was a Macedonian call where they said, come over and help us. And uh, Paul, because he, he moved on to Macedonia, in verse 14, he says, but thanks be to God who in the Messiah, Yeshua, constantly leads us in a triumphant procession and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of what it means to know him. For to God, we are the aroma of the Messiah, both among those being saved and among those being lost. To the latter, which means the lost, we're the smell of death, of, of leading only to more death. But to the former, who are those that are saved, we are the sweet smell of life leading to more life. Who's equal to such a task? Who's competent to do this is what that means. This word fragrance, when it's talking about the fragrance of what it means to know him, and uh, you know, I'm kind of old fashioned. My mother used to wear perfume when we were younger. A lot of times ladies today don't wear perfume, but I always liked the smell. I can always remember it even years later what it smelled like. I always knew when she was around. And uh, this is talking about the fragrance of the Messiah, but look at the, 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 the definition of it. It's, an, it's a fragrance that accompanies an acceptable sacrifice. Who was an acceptable sacrifice? Yeshua was. An aroma, it means a good scent. So the aroma of the Messiah is a good, it's a sweet savor. And this is a sweet aroma of sacrifice, which actually uh, might be more terrifying than death to some people. Why do I say that? Okay, well, during the days of the Roman Empire, if you could bring up that next slide for me. I'm so glad the slides are back. A little pictorial here. During the days of the Roman Empire, uh, and a war was over and a battle was won, they brought back the captives, and they had a parade down a promenade uh, with the soldiers leading them in the celebration of their victory. This was the highest honor that was bestowed on a general who returned from battle. Now, when they were returning from a battle, there were five things that they had to accomplish. There had, first of all, it had to be a complete victory. It had to be over a foreign enemy. It couldn't be a civil conflict or it couldn't involve slaves. There had to be at least 5,000 of the enemy that were killed. The territory had to be added to that country. And the battle that they were involved in had to, uh, it had to end the conflict. And the march would always start uh, and begin outside the city of Rome. Uh, the Senate paid for the march. Uh, and the senators and the magistrates led the procession. There were trumpets, there was pictures of victory. There were the spoils of war that they carried in the promenade, what they, the treasures that they took from the country that they, they pillaged. And then in the procession after them, then there was the war captives, the ones that were in chains that were the survivors that were led behind them. Then after the captives came musicians and then incense bearers. The general followed in a chariot, robed in purple, and the soldiers followed him. The streets were lined with people, and because of the incense, the incense filled the air with perfume. To the captives, the odor of that perfume was the smell of death to them. But to the army that smelled that perfume, it was life unto life because of the victory. 
And we know that uh, <clears throat> when the Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, Titus in a procession in Rome, you can see here, this is a pictorial of it that shows the menorah, which is the spoils of war being carried in that promenade. So for them, that perfume, those captives were always killed afterwards. They knew it was the smell of perfume to them was death. But to Rome, it was life. But look at Exodus 29 to 18 when it talks about a sacrifice. And leave that PowerPoint up for me. It says, Thou shalt burn a whole ram upon the altar. It's a burnt offering unto the Lord. It is a sweet savor. An offering made by fire unto the Lord. And so when a sacrifice is made unto the Lord, it's a good, it's a sweet savor. Not the kind of sacrifice that's permanent death. Well, in this Torah portion, actually, and I'm going to cover talk about the half Torah portion first, there was another preparation for battle that would mean an aroma of life after a 40-year journey. That's a long time. Hey, Mom, we're go are we going to go to Disneyland? Yeah, let's see. What is this, 1941? We should get there by 1975. <laughs> Imagine taking 40 years to get to your destination and then have to fight to get into it. Well, that was the situation in Joshua chapter two, verse one, if you bring up that PowerPoint for me, because Joshua, of course, was appointed to take the children of Israel in after these 38, 39 years from this Torah portion to come into the land from the plains of Moab. As you can see here, this is where all of the people were lined up to cross over the Jordan to get to Jericho. And it was from, uh, actually from Shedem where this Torah portion, half Torah portion starts where uh, Joshua has to send in spies to, to survey the land and to spy it out. So you can see where the plains of Moab are here and then of course Jericho uh, of which they would then go in and, and claim that city. And that's where it starts in Joshua 2.1. Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out of Shedem two men to spy secretly, saying, go, view the land, even Jericho. And they went, and it says they came to a harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. This wasn't Las Vegas. Many say that she was a harlot. It was a, there was a lot of discrepancies between rabbis. They say that she was really an innkeeper, but nevertheless, they stayed at her house. And this word spy is the word regal. It means, uh, you know, they didn't go in there with, with uh, you know, radar or with uh, drones. You know, they, wa they walked in and they spied out secretly. Uh, that word regal, is, the root of it is regal, which means it's like a foot. They walked, they walked around to find their way in. And it says they came secretly, which is the word karesh, which means very cunningly and secretly. But no matter how secret that they could be, they would still be found out. But prior to this, him sending out these spies, you have to go back one chapter after the death of Moses when uh, God tells Joshua uh, what's, what's going to happen here. And it's no different, quite frankly, than what was told to them 40 years before. Joshua 1.11, it says, Pass through the hosts, command the people, saying, Prepare you victuals, for within three days you shall pass over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God gives you to possess it. Joshua did not, and listen to this, this is important, he did not send these spies in to see whether or not they should enter the land or whether it was fertile or not. God had already given Joshua an assurance of victory. So he wasn't going in to see how big the, the armies were or what they had, how to, they had to tool up their tanks or the rocket grenades, they already, he already had an assurance. He sent in two spies just to survey, to cunningly look and see what was going on. Joshua had no doubt. But this was done secretly, not by the crowd of the people that we'll read about actually in the Torah portion. And the results of that survey were reported only back to Joshua, not to the people. And so in Joshua 2.2, it says, it was told the king of Jericho, behold, certain men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, bring forth the men that have come to you who entered your house. So even though they came in very cunningly, they were found out somehow anyway. And the king found out, said, go, he found out it was at Rahab's house, said, go get them. 
yikes, man, we used to try to hide under the bed and under the covers and all that, and I just, I know that always found us. I did one time, though, when the doctor came to our house when we were kids and we, when they used, doctors used to come to your house, when was that? <laughs> a long time ago. You know, you have really bad colds, and so the doctor would come and give you a penicillin shot, and I hated those shots. The only successful time I had in hiding from the doctor. My mother was very upset. These guys couldn't hide. They've come to search out the land. But what had happened is that Rahab, if you can bring up that slide for me, Rahab had taken the two men and hidden them. She actually hid them on the roof. And she said, yeah, true, men came to me, but I don't, know where, I don't know where they came from. And when the gate was to be closed at dark, the men actually of the city whom the king sent out, uh, he sent men out to find him because Rahab said the men went out. Where the men went, I don't know, but pursue them quickly if you'll overtake them. So she kind of, you know, sent them south. She said, you know, they, they're already gone. I, they came to me and they're gone. And so the king sent out guys to pursue them, which was going to take a while. And this word to search out uh, was a little bit different. It was to, to pry into by implication, to delve into, to explore, to search out. And that's how the king, he knew that they were getting into more of the business than, uh, than they should have. And there's a reason, a good reason why. But Rahab took the initiative to cover for these men. Why is that? And in the corridor of faith's fame in Hebrew 11, there's actually a link between Rahab, and there's a reason for it, and between Sarah, Abraham, Sarah. But in Hebrews 11, verse 8, it says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, he obeyed, and he went out, not knowing where he went. And then in Hebrews 11, 11, it says, Through faith also, Sarah herself received strength to, con to conceive seed, and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised what does this indicate about Sarah? That she had to hear, she heard the promise, okay? And through faith, she, delivered, she received strength to deliver. Well, in Hebrews 11, verse 31, it says, By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not, when she had received the spies with peace. Interesting thing about this word, believed not, uh, which is used throughout the Brit Hadashats, it's there's two words for believe, ap apostia and apatheia. Uh, this one is apatheia, which means that these people that were around her, they heard, they heard enough, they heard the news of what was going on in the region. How can you hide three million people that are, you know, 20 minutes away? You know, I mean, so they heard, but, but it says they believe not. They'd heard enough to believe, but they refused to believe, but she didn't, she believed, okay? Rahab's faith and his link with Sarah's because Sarah heard the promise. But if Rahab didn't perish, it was by faith and she must have heard. So that's why she hid the men on the roof. The men of the city went out to pursue them, and, but then she went up and talked to the men on the roof. What exactly, how does faith come? By hearing. What exactly did Rahab hear? Okay. Joshua 2.9. She said unto the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that your terror is fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have what? Heard. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we what? heard these things our hearts melted neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you for the Lord your God he is God in heaven above and in the earth beneath so what do you think this word heard is it's the word Shema Shema which we said just about 10 minutes 15 minutes ago which you know basically refers to that, that she heard and she obeyed she did something about, she paid attention. You know what? This is actually a partial fulfillment of the Song of Moses. 
Because in Exodus 15, 14, it says the people. The people shall what? Hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold on the inhabitants of Palestina. Okay, get excited about Palestina here. Then the dukes of Edom shall be amazed, mighty men of Moab. So they're on the plains of Moab, remember, waiting to go in. Trembling shall take hold upon them. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. Fear and dread shall fall upon them. By the greatness of thine arm, they shall be as still as stone. That's some pretty, that's dread, right? Palestina here is actually, uh, it's the word palasheth, uh, and it actually is referring, it's from the brook of Egypt to the border of Ekron. It's actually referring to Philistia. So it's not talking about Palestina like Palestine that we're talking about today, although it could refer to the Gaza Strip. But you know what? These guys were scared. They'd heard about what was going on. There was a new sheriff in town. The nations had heard of these events. But you know, unlike the atheists of today who don't believe in a God, the heathen in the land that day believed in the existence of a God. The atheists today don't believe in any God. The heathen then did believe in the existence of a God. The question is whether it was Jehovah, the God of Israel who was mightier than their gods. The gods that they were acquainted with were made of wood and stone. The God of Israel was invisible and still pulled off some great stuff. So what was the action actually of Rahab's faith? What was the action that she actually took? Well, look at James chapter two, verse 25. Likewise also, and just a quick preface here, we know in, in James it talks about faith without works is dead. Okay, you say, well, I got great faith. Well, then let's see something different in your life, okay? Well, likewise also wasn't Rahab the harlot justified by her works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? Well, what was her work of faith? What was her work of faith? Well, you know, the word is interesting because uh, the word defines all of its own terms. I'm almost there, Pastor Mark, hang on. <laughs> it's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul here is referring to the Thessalonians. He said, Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians. And he says in verse three, remembering, he's talking about the Thessalonians and a characteristic that they had. And he says, I re we, when we came, we remembered you guys, we remembered without ceasing your work of faith. What was the Thessalonians' work of faith? Well, in verse nine, it says, for they themselves report concerning us what a welcome we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. So what was Rahab's work of faith? She turned from idols to serve a living and a true God. It's like, Ruth, my God is your, your God is my God now, right? That's why Rahab didn't perish. Well. Rahab turned from the gods of the Amorites and the Moabites and the Canaanites. But what was her request as a result of this? She was, see, she was redeemed when, she, when the guys came in. And she hid the guys. So that was all included in her work and faith. But then she realized, hey, that God is bigger than the ones that these, you guys are worshiping. I'm going to go with that God. So she was squared away on that. Now she just needed the final deliverance which was, in verse 12, she says, now therefore I pray to you, and she's telling these two guys, I pray, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto my father's house. Give me a true token, then that you will save alive my father, my mother, my brethren, my sisters, all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. This, is, this really resounds to the Brit Hadashah in the book of Acts. When people were saved and they said, come into our house, we want the whole house to be saved. And that's what Rahab did. And the men answered her and said, well, we're gonna have an evangelistic meeting. We're gonna set a tent outside on the other side of the Jordan. We'd like you to come. We're gonna have a band and, and we're gonna have an Xbox party afterwards and we really would like you guys to come forward and accept. No. The men answered, our life for yours if you utter not our business. It'll be when the Lord hath given us the land when, the, when we come in and the Lord gives us a land, we'll deal kindly and truly with thee. And the men said to her, we will be blameless of this thine oath which you had made us swear. 
Behold, when we come into the land, and if you bring up that next slide for me, they give her specific directions. The color is no mystery, and it's not by coincidence. Thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window, which thou hast let us down by, and thou shalt bring thy father, thy mother, thy brother, and the father's household home unto thee. The color was no mistake. When we see the cord, we will come and get you. Just like the Passover, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Let's look at uh, this Joshua 6, and if you keep that slide up for me. Came the pass at the seventh time. Joshua assembles the children of Israel. They're walking around the walls. You can read the account uh, seven times, and they're going to blow the shofars, and the priests are out there. It's one big party, and it said it came to pass at the seventh time. When the priests blew the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout! I should have Brian and Curtis up here right now. <laughs> Shout, for the Lord has given you the city, and the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab, at the harlot, shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And so in verse 22, Joshua said to the two men that had spied out the country, go into the harlot's house and bring out thence the woman and all that she has, as you swear unto her. And this is exactly something like what they saw is that scarlet hanging from the window before, sometime before, I don't know how they did it, the walls came down and Rahab was saved out of it because of her faith in the God of Israel. Verse 23, it says the young men that were spies went in, they brought out Ahab and her father and her mother and her brethren and all that she had and they brought out all her kindred and it says they left them without the camp of Israel. So they brought them out, but here was Israel moving in, but they moved them aside. Why? Because they were amongst the heathen. And there had to have been some kind of a cleansing that had taken place afterwards because they were accepted into the household of Israel. How do we know that? Because it says in Joshua chapter 6, verse 25, Rahab the harlot, her father's household, and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive, and she dwelt in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent out to, to spy out Jericho. So for her, the entrance of Joshua was an aroma of life when the children of Israel came in. Rewinding back some 38, almost 39 years, Moses is preparing to take the children of Israel into the promised land. The first thing that happens is Pharaoh and the Egyptians were drowned in the Red Sea. The second thing was is that they would continue to Mount Sinai and they would receive the Torah, which they did. And then that third thing, then they were supposed to enter the land with Moses leading the way, all the way up perhaps to Mount Moriah where they would then build the temple where God would dwell amongst his people is how God saw it happening. Previous to this, this part of this Torah portion, which I'm not sure if I don't remember if Pastor Mark covered it, but it was when Miriam basically spoke against Moses. And so she was stricken with leprosy because she, had, she spoke slander against her brother. And that's actually where we begin now at the end of that where Miriam was delivered and she was put outside the camp and then it was going to be the next move for Moses to lead the children of Israel into the land of Canaan from the south, from the mountains of the Amorites. And in Numbers 13, 1, it says, The Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, If you could bring that last slide up for me there. It says, The Lord said, Send, shalach thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel of every tribe of their fathers shall you send a man, every one a ruler among them. And this word shalak, it means to send, to send them away, send them in. And amongst the 12, in verse 6, it says of the tribe of Judah, because there were other princes from the tribes that he chose. Two of those guys, it says of the tribe of Judah, was Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and of the tribe of Ephraim, 
Oshea or Joshua, who was the son of Nun. Now we know, and Pastor Mark has shared this before, and you don't really find out until Deuteronomy chapter 1 when Moses is really going over stuff, that quite frankly it wasn't Moses' idea. And it wasn't God's idea either because he had already surveyed the land. It was theirs. They could have moved right in. But they said, you know, before we do that, in verse Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 21, it says, Behold, the Lord God thy God hath set the land before thee. Go up and possess it. As the Lord God of thy fathers has said unto thee, Fear not, neither be discouraged. Carte blanche, just go, go on in. But in verse 22, it says, but you came near, every one of you came near to me. So here's the story behind the story. Okay, this was an afterthought. They said, well, you know, we want to send men before us that'll search out the land and bring us word again by which way we must go up and into what cities that will come. And this word we will send is nishlecha, which means we want, we want to send some guys in. I know you said that we have the land and, you know, we got the card to get in, but, you know, we want to go in and see, kind of just check it out. So Moses says, well, the saying pleased me well, which was probably a big mistake. So it says, I took 12 men of you, uh, one of each tribe, ex- with the exception of Levi. And the sages say here that, uh, and the rabbis, and, and this is just kind of a midrash on this, that perhaps that, you know, Moses had thought, you know, we already got the land, but, you know, these guys were pressing them. We want to go in before and see, you know, what's happening. Do they have 7-Elevens? Do they have uh, marshals? You know, is there any Macy's around there? Are there any guys we should be concerned with? Uh, and, uh, and Moses thought, well, I don't know why you guys need to go in because God's already told us we can go in. And, and so he kind of played this thing, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, okay, well, I'll appease him and say, yeah, well, go ahead, go on in. And uh, hoping that they would say, oh, well, it looks like Moses thinks it's cool, so we don't need to go in. Let's just, let's all go in. But it didn't work out that way. They wanted to go spy out the land. And so God says in this Torah portion, Numbers 13, 1, okay, send then 12 men. And that's where we will end before we get into the next thing. So let's stand and uh, we'll take a break in just a moment. Father, thank you. Um, thank you, Lord, that we know that you are a victorious God. That Father, when we walk with you, we will be a sweet aroma to those that want life. Father, help us to move uh, in your power and your love uh, and in your word uh, to bring that aroma of life to those that are seeking it Uh, and that those that don't, Father, will just drop away out of sight, that we can all look for the future redemption. Father, bless all these people that give of their time to be together with you on Shabbat, uh, to give of their resources, Father, their time, uh, their money. Uh, in tithes and offerings to bless this ministry so that we can live stream and do the many things that we do. Bless these people abundantly and bless them, Father, because they want to fellowship with you on the day that you set for rests. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua, you alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Let's take a break and thank you, Dan Cathcart and others who got the PowerPoint up. Appreciate that. Uh, One of the things we always like to uh, do at this time is to acknowledge those that have been visiting for the very first time. Uh, One of the things we like to do is find out where our visitors are from. So where are you from? Boise, Idaho. Fantastic. Yes. And how about you? Where are you from? Lacey. All right. Awesome. So good to have you uh, here. Yes. Fargo, North Dakota. Fantastic. Yes. And the lady in the back there. Tacoma. All right. It's great to have the local people come as well as those from far away. Yes. Chris in the back. Kent. All right. Kent, Washington. It's always good to have people from all over. And I think that's everyone here. 
Uh, one of the things we definitely uh, want to do is thank all those that are live streaming with us. So like I said earlier, over 130 cities, over 15 countries, and let's welcome all of those people as well. You're a part of El Shaddai just as well. One of the things that we also want to do uh, after worship, when we come up to pray, we want to definitely remember those people in Oklahoma. I tell you what, those tornadoes have just been horrible, devastating. More people have died. And we just want to pray for uh, our own people here, you know, in the United States as well. But let's stand as we listen to the sound of the shofar. I can hardly wait till that day when we hear the heavenly shofar. Not that these guys aren't good. They're great. But it's going to be awesome when uh, I believe we're going to be playing the shofars. They'll be on the Feast of Trumpets. They'll be blowing. And all of a sudden, we're here those heavenly shofars. But let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for your Torah. We thank you for all the visitors that are coming. Father, we thank you for all those that are live streaming. We just pray a blessing upon them. But Father, right now, both local, far and wide, it's just so exciting to me that we can have people all over the world at the same time with us at every time zone, worshiping you and praising you. So when you look down on this world, on this Shabbat, on your appointed time, you can see there are people all over the world that just love you with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. We commit this time for you. And Father, we want to hear from you. And we want to bless you. And we thank you for everything you've done in our lives. In Yeshua's name, amen. You are God. You are the King of Kings, the Lord over all the earth. And we just love you when we thank you. You are the King of Kings. Father, right now we just come before you and lift our hands. You're our Abba. You're our Daddy. And Father, we have needs. We're a needy people. Father, we just lift up those right now that have financial needs. We just pray, Lord, that you would open the windows of heaven and bless them. Those are people that need jobs or people that need homes. Father, I can't help but think of those uh, people in Oklahoma, many who have lost their homes or lost their lives. We just lift them up to you right now and ask that your shalom, your peace would rule and reign in their hearts. That people would rally around them and help them as they rebuild. Father, there are people here with emotional needs spiritual needs and so father we just open our hearts before you we just want to become an open vessel and we just pray lord that you would fill every one of these vessels with your spirit that you would meet those needs that you would draw people into a saving relationship with you that they would come to know you in a mighty way and even after that they would make you known to all of their friends and their neighbors just what a wonderful god you are and Father, we lift up the nation of Israel to you right now as well as uh, things are heating up over there in the Middle East. We just pray for your protection over your people, your blessing upon them. And again, as we ask every week, we ask that you would give their leaders wisdom, their political leaders, their military leaders. Protect your people, oh God. Even as you said in Daniel, that those who know their God will be strong and do exploits. Father, we believe that they're going to have the heart of David and they will be strong and they will do exploits. But above all, we pray that they would come into a, a saving relationship with you, that they would return back to their Torah, that they would truly love you with all of their heart, mind, soul, and strength. You prophesied in your word, you would circumcise their hearts. God, we just pray for that circumcision of the heart of your people. And we thank you for them. We thank you that we can come and sit and learn of you in your word. Bless your people in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 Thank you. You can be seated. It is so good to have everyone here live streaming and with us. Uh, 
again, uh, I was just so grateful for the, the speakers we had this last week at the conference. I know many of you were blessed because of that, and we're so grateful for all those that were live streaming and watching, and for those who have helped uh, pay for the conference through their uh, tithes and their offerings. I just want you to know personally that we're very grateful, and we're very thankful to all of you. But at this time, let's welcome Pastor Art. Okay, thank you, Pastor Mark. And, uh, you know, as Pastor Mark, he, he talked about, uh, and by the way, welcome everyone uh, that is just joining us now in the second half live streaming. Uh, we're glad to have you. We're in the Torah portion, Shalak. But uh, as you prayed uh, for Israel, for the, those in the administration, as well as our own administration for wisdom to do the right thing, all, almost all rabbis and sages and Jewish people today agree that Israel was unified when they were at Sinai, <clears throat> when they received the Torah. After that, kind of went like this. Today, it's kind of going like this. When you have those in the government that are, you know, one, one are saying we need a two-state, the other ones aren't, and so on, you don't have unity. And Israel needs to be unified, particularly for their benefit and for ours as well. So, we are in numbers uh, in Shalak, and I believe I stopped at, uh, in Deuteronomy 121, talking about uh, how it was their idea originally to go uh, to send the spies. But uh, I want to mention something that somebody brought to my attention at the break about Rahab. Uh, Rahab, even though she was called a harlot, uh, she, or she was an innkeeper, whatever, uh, I guess we'll find out someday. But uh, when they brought her out, she was without, outside the camp of Israel, and then it says in the, in the next few verses that she became a part of Israel. It doesn't mean that God had to chase everybody out. He says, if they want to stay, they got to turn to me. Rahab and her family obviously did because she was included in the bloodline of the Messiah, which is huge. See, God can use anybody, even a harlot. You know, the word search is used in this Torah portion four times. In this particular Torah portion, Shalak, it's used three times in the half Torah. In, uh, and then again in Numbers 13, um, is my PowerPoint up? Okay, I already did here, so if it's not up, it's not up. In verse 3 of Numbers 13, it says, Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. It says, these are the names of the men in verse 16, which Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Hosea, the son of Nun, Yehoshua, or Joshua. But uh, his name was spelt a certain way. It was spelt with a, a, a hay, a vav, a sheen, and an uh, ayin. And uh, what, God, what Moses actually did is he added a U to the beginning of his name, so it became Joshua. And uh, it means, originally, the, the word actually means salvation. And when the U is added, it's right here, it's God saves. Uh, but when that yud is added, and we also know a derivative of that is Yeshua, which is our salvation. So it was Joshua was the one who would lead the people just like Yeshua leads us. This word here for spy is the word latour, which means to meander about. And that's uh, what they would, uh, these spies were, were supposed to do. These surveyors would meander about. But it's clear that one who is sent is answerable to the one who sends him. His mission is to faithfully carry out the mission to the point of origin and to faithfully return with a response. That's what they were supposed to do. And he gave them the criteria when they went into the land. He said, see the land, see the people, whether they're strong or they're weak, whether they're few or many, if the land is good or it's bad. Uh, if they live in open cities, then they're strong. And if they, uh, because they rely on their own strength. If they live in fortified cities, they may be weak. Uh, they wanted to know whether, Moses wanted to know whether the land was fat or it was lean, if it had water, if it had trees. And then he said, bring of the fruit of the land. And so, I'll go to my next PowerPoint here. I can see what it is. It's... <laughs> In Numbers 13, 22, it says they ascended, the, 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 the spies went into the land, and that's what you would have seen on the PowerPoint as the map, but they went out through the land, uh, and then they made their way back. They went through Hebron, where uh, uh, the patriarchs were buried, and it says they ascended by the south, and they came unto Hebron, where 
Ahimon, Sheshai, and Talmai, the children of Anak, were, who were the giants, sons of the giant. And it says, now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And you wonder why, uh, you know, why is this line thrown in here just out of the blue about Hebron? And it was really to show the excellency of Hebron where the patriarchs were buried. Zoan was actually an area where the children of Israel were led out by the Exodus. It was almost the, the capital uh, of Egypt. Uh, and it, was, uh, it talks about in Genesis about how areas in Egypt were well watered like the Garden of Eden. And so Zoan was a magnificent city, yet it says Hebron was built seven years before that. It was a more excellent place to be. It was very fertile. In fact, it says in verse 23, it says, So they came to the brook Eskol, and they cut down from thence a branch with one of the cluster of grapes. So they were doing what, what Moses asked them to do, bring back some of the fruit of the land, and they bore it between two upon a staff, and they brought of the pomegranates and the figs. But they were huge, pomegranates and figs. They're in the land for 40 years. Now, after a year in the desert, okay, during which time they came out of Egypt, they built the tabernacle. Uh, the priesthood was installed. Aaron was the high priest. And now they were, were ready to move forward. This was where they would complete the process of the redemption. So they had to shift in their consciousness. All of these people, they had to shift in their consciousness from the slavery mentality to being here in the desert, okay? They had to shift the mentality of being in the desert to moving into this promised land. Well, they had to not only see themselves that they were on the road to the promised land, but they had to realize that they were the rightful owners and that they were coming in to claim it. There's a difference. There must have been a time between that exodus and this particular point, as the spies are coming back, that there was a crisis in faith, in, in faith that worsened since they left Egypt. And it was a very vulnerable time for them because they had to make a change in their consciousness to where they were going. And they had to do this as quickly as possible. This was the point where the spies were sent into the land. Their response and their actions would have been a catalyst for the children of Israel for transforming their consciousness to move into the land and to prepare them for redemption. But in Numbers 13, 25, and as uh, Mark on the worship team had indicated, they returned from searching of the land after 40 days, and they went and came to Moses and to Aaron, which is what they were supposed to do, which is what they did with Joshua. They came back to Joshua, but they reported to Joshua. These guys came back to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel, unto the, unto the wilderness of Paran, to Kadesh, and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. It mentions in this verse, it says, unto all the congregation twice. It makes a big deal out of it that they came to Moses and Aaron, but then it mentions that they, came, they, they went to the congregation too. They probably said some things that they shouldn't have done and should have reported strictly to Moses and Aaron. They needed to be messengers that would confirm the words of, the God, of God's promise. Instead, they ended up inciting the people. And here's how it went in verse 27. They told them, and they said, Okay, let me just back up for a minute. Is that on? Oh, there it is. Okay. Here's the wilderness of Paran, the wilderness of, of Zin. Here's Kadesh Barnea. And so they took off up in this area, came around, uh, and then came back through Hebron. And they brought the, that nice uh, cluster of grapes uh, that was with them. And now uh, where was I? In 20, verse 27, it says, They told him when they came to Moses and Aaron, We came into the land that you sent us, and surely it flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Good, good testimony. And then this is where it kind of went downhill from there. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. The cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. 
and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. Lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. This word, nevertheless, became a breaking point in the wrong direction. All the energy that was invested in the previous year diverted their focus and led them into a wrong line of thinking. Think about your own life. Think really hard about your own life. Places where you were on your journey and the word nevertheless came in and it diverted your course. It's not too late to get the back on course. Now, we look at these current events. Some people don't look at the news at all. They don't even know where Israel is. But we know that Israel has a lot to do with the destiny of all peoples. So we keep an eye on what's going on. The same breakdown in the transition in Israel's consciousness occurred in the Zionist movement in the early part of the 20th century. The breakdown with Israel, as it appears today with the disunity amongst the administration and amongst others in Israel and those in the land and out of the land, did not begin with the Oslo Accords. It didn't begin back as far as 1967 in the Six Day War or even in 1948 with the War of Independence. These symptoms were felt as soon as the Spirit began to move the Jews from around the world to resettle in the land of Israel. Immediately in the early 1900s, after the League of Nations agreed to create a Jewish homeland in the land of Israel, this was then mandated by the Brits, the British. The Zionists agreed to divide the land between a Jewish homeland and an Arab state, subsequently today called Jordan. And this was done in the name of political pragmatism. But at its core, it reflected a disbelief that the Jews had actually arrived. 2,000 years of exile were now over. God had finally brought the Jewish people home. But this same breakdown in this consciousness has plagued the Jewish people today in their disunity in government. If you bring up that next slide for me, here's a three happy amigos. Kerry's chance is slim to revive the peace process. We got a smile here, here maybe, not so happy right here, right? But we have our own issue here. Kerry calls for a treaty based on pre-1967 lines with land swaps. Just as, just as Joshua was sure when he sent those spies that the land was theirs to take. There was no question about it. But yet here, and this is just dated May 8th, Jews are attacked for praying on the Temple Mount. Why? Because it's the God of Israel who honors prayer. And so, when Caleb saw the direction that this was going in, he spoke out. In Numbers 13.30, Caleb stilled the people. It means he told them to shut up. He stilled the people before Moses and he said, let's go up now at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the negative response from the 10 spies became stronger. In verse 31, the men that went up with them said, we're not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they'd searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eats the inhabitants up. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And we saw the giants, the sons of Anak. And you know, at first it looked great. You know, here they bring back a report. If you bring that slide up for me, thank you. Here's the clusters that, you know, first they give the nice positive impression talked it over a little bit, and then they started talking about the giants, the sons of Anak, which comes of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. So that's how they saw themselves. That's how they looked at themselves, that they were small. And so they brought an evil report from the land, 
in the beginning of verse 32, which is the word deba, which means basically slander, infamy against, against the land. This is how we saw ourselves, that we were like grasshoppers. And so these 10 men, they stirred up strife in the congregation. In Numbers 14, 1, all the congregation, they, then they spread it around to everybody. This isn't what you think, guys. And then they started doubting about Moses. They lifted up their voice and they cried and they wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, it's their fault. They brought us in here. We never should have moved. We never should have left our house. We never should have sold that house. I never should have stayed with that woman. My kids never should have went to that school. And they blamed Moses and Aaron and the whole congregation said unto them, would that God, would God that we died in the land of Egypt or would we die in this wilderness? Then why has God brought us into this land to fall by the sword that our wives and children should be a prey? Talk about vain imaginations. Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? So then they wanted to usurp Moses and Aaron. So they said, let's make another captain and go back to Egypt. That's God's favorite place to send people back to. In verse 6, and it says, And Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, they rent their clothes. And they spoke to the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search, it's an exceedingly good land. Only rebel not against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Now listen to this. Their defense, as Mark mentioned, is departed from them. That means that there was protection on the Canaanites before the children of Israel came into the land, and God lifted that defense so that the children of Israel could come right in. The Lord is with us, fear them not. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. Sometimes a good report looks like a smell of death to others. Now, the ten, these 10 spies, these emissaries, they start their report with a positive statement. You know, we talk about pessimists and optimists, half full, half empty. They started with a positive statement about the land flowing with milk and honey, and then they switched to a, a negatively colored description of the fortified cities and the powerful people. The rabbis describe this dialogue as the way that slanderers speak. They begin with flattering and they end with evil. Or in more modern terms, the pessimist will observe a situation, generalize about the bad aspects, and interpret them as a permanent and a constant feature. It's one thing to say, you might point out bad aspects of something, but when you accept it as permanent defeat, then you're truly a pessimist. In contrast, an optimist observes the same situation. He sees the bad aspects, but particularizes them and interprets them as a, just a temporary obstacle that can be overcome. And that's the way we have to look at our lives. Do we take temporary misfortune as permanent defeat? That's where that word nevertheless comes in. Well, then this became the sin of the scouts. Their failure then became the lack or the failure to contribute to their community because of their negative attitude and their narrow perspective. They seemingly lacked the courage to leap into the unknown and to confront no man's land. Joshua and Caleb saw potential success and possibility. They had the courage to leap into the unknown. Now, Chaim Kofetz, who wrote uh, a, a book on uh, laws of proper speech, he even speaks about flattery. And when he talks about, as I just mentioned, how the rabbis talked that this was a form of slander, Chaim Kofetz said, strife often leads to the sin of flattery as those who are disputing will prey on others in order to gain support, and to mockery as they ridicule the other in order to draw people into their camp. The Yetzer Hara, which is the evil inclination, has two avenues that he can draw men of spiritual stature. Anger and a desire to triumph can become a cause that can lead an individual to failure. 
And so the Lord was very displeased with the 10 spies. He said to Moses, how long are these people gonna provoke me? How long will it be before they believe me with all the signs? I'm gonna smite them with pestilence. I'm gonna disinherit them. And I will make of you, Moses, a greater nation. And Moses said, whoa, hold it. The Egyptians will hear if you do that. They're gonna hear it and then they'll tell the neighbors. Can't tell the neighbors. For they've heard that the Lord art among his people, and the Lord has seen, you've seen him face to face. If you kill this people, and this isn't on your notes, I'm just reading it here. If you kill his people as one man, then the nations will hear that the Lord was not able to bring them into this land that he swore, and then he slew them in the wilderness. And so Moses does an incredible thing. He begins to intercede here for the children of Israel. Now all of you know, and this is on your notes, and this is interesting, bring up that PowerPoint for me. He goes into interceding for them, but you know that in Exodus 34, seven, when the Lord showed himself to Moses about his 13 attributes of God's character, you remember that? Pastor Mark taught, always taught, teaches on that so wonderfully. Well, Moses, and actually I shared two or three weeks ago about Jeremiah, that Jeremiah, in interceding for his people, also brought up the 13 attributes, but not completely. And Moses did so such here. Numbers 14, 17, he begins to intercede, but we're going to take a look at Exodus 34, 6, which is the 13 attributes. It says, the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, Elohim, merciful, which is the word raccoon, which means compassionate and gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, which means showing grace to the thousandth generation, which is from the complete Jewish Bible, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and what by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. This was a different show right here. Because Moses pleads, but he doesn't plead all of the 13 attributes. Because in the 13 attributes, God is the Lord, the Lord God, it's confirmed. That disappears. Merciful, which is compassionate, compassionate upon their sin, that disappears. And gracious, even though God is abundant in goodness and in his kindness, it might be available to a repentant sinner, but Moses knew that they had no remorse for their rebellion. Goodbye. Long suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Truth here is admitted, omitted in this situation because in accordance with truth, they should be held guilty of the sin of rebellion and slander. So what does Moses end up doing? Well, he goes even further in keeping mercy for thousands. That's not included either. And that's omitted because of the protective influence of the patriarchs to which the land was promised. These people did not deserve that merit for which the patriarchs so faithfully believed in. So with long suffering, Moses was persistent here in asking God to exercise his patience. He wanted God to temper his judgment with mercy by postponing entry into the land instead of destroying them for the sake of his name. And so, we see what he does say in Numbers 14, 17. He says, I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great according as thou hast spoken, saying, and he goes into what is the only merit that's left for these people. The Lord is long-suffering. Please be patient with these guys and be of great mercy. Forgive the iniquity and the transgression and by no means clearing the guilty and visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the third and fourth generation and upon the children. Pardon, he asks, I beseech the iniquity of this people. And so it says in Hebrews chapter three, verse seven, he couldn't ask all of these things for the people because they should have known better after seeing all the things that God had done for them since Egypt. And so in verse seven it says, wherefore as the Holy Ghost says, today if you will hear his voice, 
Harden not your hearts as in the provocation and the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works for 40 years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. In verse 17, but with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swore he that should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. And that was the penalty that they had to pay for that unbelief. One year for every day that the spies were in the land. And this was the judgment in verse 33. Your children shall wander in the wilderness 40 years and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of the days which you search the land, even 40 days, each day for a year, shall you bear your iniquities, even 40 years, and you shall know my breach of promise. Who took the children into the promised land? Joshua did. Who takes us? Yeshua, our salvation. This day that the spies slandered the land became the worst day in Jewish history, known as the Ninth of Av. Can you bring that PowerPoint up for me? And it says that they wept all that night. And the Lord said, I will establish this night. And so on the Ninth of Av, what do we see happening? We see the, temple, the first temple destroyed on the Ninth of Av. And then we see again in 70 AD, we see the temple destroyed on the 9th of Av. The Jews were expelled from England in 1290 and expelled from Spain in 1492. World War I began on the 9th of Av. And Hitler signed the final solution on the 9th and the final solution began on the 9th of Av. And they were expelled from the ghetto in Warsaw on the 9th of Av as well. So that the 9th of Av today is a day of fasting. But this applied with those 12 spies to all but two. And this is where our faith comes in. Because in verse 24 of Numbers 14, God tells him, My servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and has followed me fully, here's the criteria, him will I bring into the land where into he went, and his seed shall possess it. Criteria is really not that much, is it? Just believe me and follow me fully. And then in verse 38, but Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jehuna, which were of the men that went to search the land, lived still. And years later, after they were in the land and Joshua was dividing the land by lot to, for their inheritance, Caleb recalls this particular event on the 9th of Av when they were in the land receiving their allotments. And it says that as they were divvying out the land, which would have been 45 some years later, the children, the children of Judah came to Joshua and Gilgal. And Caleb came to him and said, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and you and Kadesh Barnea. And in verse 7 on your notes, 40 years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought him word again. This is in Joshua, actually, 14, verse 7. I brought him word again as it was in my heart. You see, the consciousness shifted with Caleb. He was ready to go. Joshua and Caleb's consciousness was, let's go do this. The other guy's consciousness didn't shift. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed my, the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance, and thy children's forever, because thou has wholly followed the Lord my God. And then he says, and this isn't on your notes, the Lord kept me alive these 45 years, even since the Lord spoke unto Moses. 
I am now this day four score and five years old. Joshua was 85 when he finally took his inheritance, but it was as Moses and God promised. And yet I'm as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me, as my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. How would you like that testimony? And so in verse 3 of Joshua 14, Joshua blessed him and gave unto Caleb the son of Jephunneh Hebron for his inheritance. Where the giants were, the giants, of course, as Pastor Mark says, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and also the sons of Anak, the giants, which in Hebron, Caleb took care of it. Their assurance that they would enter the land came immediately. Now in Numbers 15:1 it says, The Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When you come into the land of your habitations which I give unto you. This is after the penalty was announced to them, that they would be wandering for another 30, 38 to 39 years in the wilderness before they came into the land. Right away the Lord turns around and he says, Speak to the children of Israel when you come into the land. He gives them an assurance that, yes, you will come into the land. And he goes into certain instructions and sacrifices and so on that they'll do when they come into the land. That's a, that wasn't an easy put, a, a, a put, whether you want to call it a put down or raising the people up from the consciousness that they had that they were in defeat. Now, as I started off, this sharing today in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15. Think about your lives for a second. Rabbi Shaul said, he says, For to God we are the aroma of the Messiah, both among those being saved and among those being lost. To the latter, we're the smell of death, leading only to more death. But to the former, we are the sweet smell of life, leading to more life. Who's equal to such a task? If you could bring up that, these last couple of PowerPoints and just leave them up for me, thank you. Who's competent to be this aroma of life unto life? Are we going to be this procession that will be leading victory for people's lives? Look what he says here in ver chapter 3, verse 1. Are we starting to recommend ourselves to you again, talking to the Corinthians? Or do we, like some, need letters of recommendation either to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter of recommendation, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You make it clear that you are a letter from the Messiah placed in our care, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on stone tablets, but on human hearts. Think about your life. Are you an aroma, or you have the, the epistles of the Lord written upon your heart, the Torah written upon your heart, to where it burns within your heart? What is it that you place on other people that you are a scent and aroma of life unto life? Which one do you want to be? Do you want to be the ten spies, or you want to be the two that enter in? That will determine how the direction of your life goes. The Lord goes even further. Such is the confidence we have through the Messiah towards God. It's not that we are competent in ourselves to count anything as having come from us. On the contrary, our competence comes from God. Well, what residue do we leave on people? Is it a report like the ten spies or from the two that were faithful? Yeshua said in John 7, verse 16, Jesus answered them and he said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. This is from the Brit Hadashah portion of this Torah portion. It's he that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it's from God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaks of himself seeks his own glory, but he that seeks his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. That was the heart of Caleb and Joshua, to bring the testimony of the God to his glory that he would bring their people, his people, into the land. The Lord wants us to be impacted with that word. And so in Numbers 15, 37, the Lord spoke unto Moses besides some other directives that he gave him, and he said, Speak unto the children of Israel, 
and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue and it sh shall be unto you for a fringe that they may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord to do them and that you seek, it's the word tour, spy not after your own heart and your own eyes after which you used to go a whoring that you might remember to do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. What the Lord told them to do was on their four cornered garments was to hang what was called tzitzit which you see here with a ribbon of blue and as they wore it and as they saw it they would remember to keep God's commandments but look at the words that he uses which are in this Torah portion to do the commandments of the Lord and that you seek, you don't spy after your own heart and with your eyes. They say that the heart and the eyes are the spies of the body. They act as agents. The eyes see, the heart covets, but the body commits the sin. Do we wanna be our aroma of life or do we wanna be an aroma of death when we look at that teat seat? And do, and, and do the commandments by looking at that instead of looking at the bad side. Do we want to enter the land by the mountain of the Amorites or do we want to go with the multitude by way of Jordan? That's your decision. Amen? Let's stand. Father, we all need to make decisions day by day, moment by moment. And Father, that... Uh, as we become drenched in your word, Father, as we become energized by the power of your Holy Spirit, as we set our affection on things above and not on things on the earth, that, Father, we will be able to, uh, to spy after your things and not to, to spy after the lustful things of the world, that, so that indeed we can become an aroma of life to those that seek life and not death. So Father, lead this people, and Father, speak to their hearts and their minds that they might follow the good and the right way, to have the heart of a Joshua and Caleb, to enter the land, Father, as you see fit. And we thank you for that in Yeshua's name. In the Lord's Prayer, it says, uh, lead us out from the way of testing and deliver us from all evil. And God did that very thing and when he <clears throat> told Moses to tell Aaron how to bless his people because we need those blessings to continue, to continue to be a good aroma. And this is how he told them to bless his people. He said, Ivarechaka Yahweh Adonai, V'yishmarecha, the Lord bless you and keep you. <clears throat> Yair Yahweh Adonai, Pana V'yaleka V'yunecha, the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Go in peace. Have a great Shabbat. Thank you for studying with us today. If you have any questions regarding the material discussed, please contact me at my email address. It's pastormark at elshadiministries.us. Be blessed and shalom.